My name is David Brown. I have this YouTube channel and a blog called The Trendy Troodon. Uh, for this video, I'm going to be talking about the worst movies I've reviewed. Uh, this is, at this point, out of 240 movies I've covered at one time or another and reviewed. And this is the second time I've done the video, uh, which I have usually done in one take. Uh, this is really not because it didn't go poorly when I tried this, but I was still uh, not decided what I want to do. Uh, what I decided is that I do want to cover all ten of what I had previously listed <coughs> as the worst movies reviewed on my blog. Now, I have uh, very often said I don't really believe in listing the worst movies. The real issue is that at a certain level, it's something where there is no bottom. Uh, one big thing on that vein is that there's a lot of stuff that we just don't have. Uh, with silent movies, obviously, the good ones are gone, rather the bad ones are gone, so are a lot of the good ones. Uh, with 30s, to some extent 40s movies, there's still a preservation bias. The stuff that was absolutely terrible, a lot of it is just gone. Uh, and what does survive was probably more like average, or somewhat below average at worst. Uh, with 50s also, uh, you really have different standards of quality. <coughs> In the 50s, to some extent the 60s, you could still have people who didn't really have a professional level of equipment or budget or talent who are still making movies that got into the theaters. Uh, if you then get into the simple question of what to count as a movie, uh, by about 1970, if it got into a theater, it met what you could consider a minimum standard or high standard of mediocrity. Uh, now, that uh, still leaves some big exceptions. Uh, the obvious thing is TV movies. Uh, in the 70s, it was kind of the golden age. Uh, that was when you had things like Duel that launched Steven Spielberg's career and got into theaters uh, after it was shown on TV. Uh, but then you had a high volume of ones that weren't good, uh, the worst one I've actually reviewed is called uh, The Time Machine from 1978. It was supposed to be an adaptation of H.G. Wells, but it wasn't really. Uh, now, the thing about the TV movies, you can apply some minimum professional standards. Uh, they did have some money behind them, and especially they were made for what you could consider a mainstream audience. It wasn't like propaganda or adult films where they only needed or were trying to appeal to a very limited audience. Uh, on the other hand, there's a point where you have to just say truth in advertising. A lot of them look cheap and cheesy now, Mostly, though, they would have looked cheap and cheesy then. They were cheap and cheesy. And the other thing is, most of them uh, were never intended to be shown more than once or a few times. Uh, they certainly didn't expect people 40 or 50 years later to be coming back and looking at them. Uh, and then even from the 70s, you do have movies that never really got a regular release. And the one that's most interesting is a film called Deathbed. This was honorable mention, dishonorable mention, rather, for my 10 worst movies list. It's definitely very far down as far as quality. 
Uh, but then it's a little hard to say how much was that they didn't know what they were doing, how much was that they didn't have any money, and how much was that they were doing something else. It's about a bed in this what's supposed to be medieval or gothic castle, and people keep coming into the castle trying to use the bed, only the bed is possessed by a demon that eats people. Uh, and this is something where it's a film, but I have been very strongly inclined not to consider it a movie. Uh, it, or it's in some ways really like what you might see in a silent movie. A lot of What's spoken is really just narration, which a silent movie would have done with the cards. And when there is dialogue, uh, it's read by actual actors and actresses rather than just narrated. Uh, but there was no effort to synchronize things. Uh, there's times when a character is supposed to be talking, but you can see the actor or actress and very clearly the lips are not moving. So it's just so weird, you really can't judge it on any other standard. It's just there, take it or leave it. Now, going into my actual list, there were two right at the top. In many ways they're different, but in others, uh, they're the same kind of thing. They're movies that weren't especially low budget, uh, but they tried to be controversial, uh, but really ended up just offensive or completely stupid. Uh, the first of these is called Hard Rock Zombies, and I would consider it the worst zombie movie I've reviewed for a dedicated feature I created for this. Uh, it's supposed to be a comedy, which gives it some leeway. It's about this really mild heavy metal or really hair metal band uh, that gets murdered, comes back to life, and that triggers a zombie apocalypse. Uh, what's really a fairly common denominator is that it was originally a short film that was worked into another movie, uh, and that accounts for most of the m segments that are pretty good. Uh, they stretch it out to a full-length feature, and it just didn't work. And it's really hard to say why it wouldn't work. There's enough ideas. It should have been good, or at least interesting, but it's not. Another is called Sleepwalkers, and the thing about that is that Stephen King was involved. Apparently it was a story that he had written but never published. Then he... Uh, wrote it out into a screenplay, and on a quality level, you might say it's just mediocre, but it goes really far with the offensive stuff. Uh, it's literally a mother and son who are these vampire creatures, and there's a very explicitly incestuous relationship between them. And uh, they are openly preying on humans. Uh, the son will seduce teenage girls. Uh, and, yes, there's a lot more. It actually isn't too bad when it's in the usual exploitation territory, like there's quite a bit of action or violence. That at least gets to a so bad it's good level, uh, where it's energetic, uh, but a lot of it, it acts like it's being intellectual when, again, it's just defensive. And I'm going to be taking a look now and then at the list I have. Uh, another one here is called The Nest from 1988. It was produced not by Roger Corman, but by his spouse named Julie Corman, and this is the kind of film I really consider harmlessly bad. It's about a colony of insects that become aggressive, and then right in the final act they introduce the idea of uh, the 
insects growing to human size and imitating humans. So it's like a weird preview, what I'd call a prototype of mimic. Uh, and there's really not much that's actively irritating or offensive here, uh, but the special effects definitely aren't good. Not as good as they probably would have been if Corman had did it, at least when he still had a talent that had moved on by then, like James Cameron. Yes, and another on this list is uh, the kind of thing I find most irritating, which is a big-budget movie that's either irritating, disappointing, or actively boring. Uh, another one like this that I gave dishonorable mention is Star Trek The Motion Picture. Uh, people argue if it's really the worst Star Trek movie. Certainly if you compare it to Star Trek V, there's a case uh, that one was at least more competent. Uh, but then, to me, it was much more disappointing. Uh, and with Santa Claus the movie, it's on about the same level, except uh, this time even the stuff the money would have gone into, especially the effects, isn't even that good. Uh, the whole idea, it was made in 1985, they were trying to be both hip and nostalgic, and that just didn't work. And so uh, there's a lot of special effects sequences that just look like they could have been filmed in the 1950s or 1960s, and they wouldn't have even been that good even then. And what irritated me the most is that they set up uh, arguments that the people involved would have had no position to argue. The whole setup is that these old wooden toys... Are, that Santa somehow still gives out are good, and the stuff from this evil toy maker played by John Lithgow, who literally gets shot into space in the ending, are all dangerous garbage. Uh, if you really look and know your history, sure, you could argue things back and forth. The thing is, those old-fashioned toys had lead and splinters, and they just were not made to modern safety standards. And to even get to that, you have to go back to the early 1900s or even the 1800s, whereas even in the 40s and 50s, you had toys that were mass-produced out of plastic, like the Marx Toy Soldiers. And so anyone still alive in the 80s, unless they were a historian, had no authority to comment about it. And one more thing, uh, they introduce a homeless child, which is really similar to a Twilight Zone episode, original Twilight Zone, Night of the Meek. Uh, that actually did a good job, especially for 60s TV, showing poverty, and complete despair. This sets up like they're going to deal with that, but they never get anywhere remotely serious. And number six, people would really have expected to be a whole lot higher or lower, ever you look at it on this list, Space Mutiny. That was the one that was made in South Africa with uh, some low budget or low budget American actors or actors who had been good but gone into hard times. There was Reb Brown who played Captain America on TV. There was John Philip Law who had played Sinbad in the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Uh, but then a whole bunch of their stuff was either stolen effects from Battlestar Galactica, or filmed in warehouses, uh, where you could very obviously see it was a modern warehouse. And what irritated me about this is that even within their limitations, they could have done better. They could at least have, uh, with the warehouse, 
done a little sci-fi dressing, covered the obvious stuff, especially the windows of the warehouse, which you can clearly see, and it also, just from how it was made, where it was made, gives a very bad vibe. Uh, part of it is that it shows this evil villain who's torturing people, and the main characters do almost nothing about it. And consider that with South African politics at the end of apartheid, it's just not even something you want to look, go any further talking about. And then we get into the bottom five. And uh, the first one here is a movie called ZPG, or Zero Population Growth. It was part of the panic in the late 60s and 70s about overpopulation. Uh, the whole thing, people were panicking that there was somehow going to be more people than we could feed which is not actually possible in any ecological sense. Uh, if people can't eat, they literally can't breed. And with this, uh, the whole setup is that there is a dystopian state uh, that's declared nobody can have children at all for a completely arbitrary 20-year period. Uh, then when... The main characters do have a child, they have to hide it, and then when they're detected, they get hunted down and set up for execution. You can really argue whether or not they are executed, or if the supposedly happy ending is real. What bothered me about that was that uh, there's no effort to question uh, the setup. Uh, what they show is an environment where there isn't even a breathable atmosphere. So, of course, there might be people crowded into very small areas, but that doesn't mean overpopulation is the real problem. But then uh, there's no further analysis of that. And I, what I had researched is that there was a novel version of the movie that ended up getting released before it was out in theaters uh, that questioned the scenario even less. Uh, so that right there was enough to put it on my radar for uh, not a good movie quality-wise and very stupid conceptually. And another here. Yes, yeah, so this was one of the more recent movies I've reviewed. For me, anything that's less than 10 or even 20 years old is unusual. Mostly I cover... 70s and 80s, a little earlier or later, but not by much. Uh, this is called Man-Thing. It was actually, at least technically, a Marvel movie. And as you might guess, uh, Marvel has tried to distance themselves as far as how much they were involved. Uh, it's really kind of... Marvel says, and the people on the other side have just been quiet about it, it was actually made in Australia, so it wasn't an American film, and it ended up not getting a U.S. theatrical release. It has this character, it looks like a knockoff of Swamp Thing, except technically uh, Marvel actually published comics with the character first. Uh, so there's a bunch of people killed by the creature. Some of them are bad guys working for a company. A lot of them, though, are... Uh, either unrelated people who had no involvement at all, or even good guys who would be on Man-Thing's side. There's even a Native American who's killed. Uh, but so much of the movie is just nothing happening, and the acting is not good in almost all cases. And... There's actually some decent effects, but they just aren't used or developed enough for it to make a difference either way. And this was all around 2005. Yes, so it was definitely when we had a pretty high standard of quality, even for movies that were made for direct-to-video or cable distribution. 
and now we're into the top bottom three and this is one of the very first movies I've reviewed. It's called Insemnoid by a guy named Norman J. Warren. Uh, yes, this guy was on at least the level of Ed Wood, possibly worse, especially since he usually had something like a decent budget. And he did a lot of stuff that was supposed to be controversial or offensive that's just stupid. Uh, something like that that in some ways you might consider worse is a movie called Prey that I also reviewed. Uh, that was actually about a lesbian couple who encounter an alien. And it's not nearly as good as it might sound just from that description. And with Insemnoid, then, it came out a little after Prey, uh, it, and it ended up getting a very delayed re release. And the whole plot is that there's a space expedition that discovers this alien temple or artifact. Uh, then a woman gets assaulted by this alien creature that leaves her pregnant. And then she goes psychotic and starts killing the other people. A lot of people assumed it was a ripoff of Alien, which it really wasn't. Uh, it's really what I w have called a runner-up, uh, like a movie that was very similar to a popular one, but had independent or mostly independent origin. <laughs> yes, and... It's uh, a lot of the time just tedious. Sometimes it gets a bit energetic, but even then what you're really seeing is people being stupid and cowardly. Uh, and overall, it really could have been good, at least interesting, uh, which is a common denominator with prey. Uh, but in practice, it just doesn't live up even to a so bad it's good level. Uh, then the second one from the top bottom one is called War of the Planets. And for a very long time, I thought uh, it was going to be the worst movie I had, would ever review. And it's by a guy named Alfonso Brescia. And if you know 70s and 80s, really low-budget film, that will give you a red flag right there. This was an Italian filmmaker who made a whole bunch of movies. Like, he got up to four or five uh, just using the same sets and props, they all look on the level of 60s science fiction, only probably low budget even for then. Uh, so the whole plot is that there's this ship in space, they discover a lost civilization that's ruled by a computer, and they have to team up with the surviving native people to defeat the computer. It's portrayed as this giant robot from the waist up and from the waist down. It looks like uh, the controls of a 1920s, 30s electric organ. Uh, and everything about it is right at the border between what seems incompetent and what seems actively lazy, I would say it's in the direction of actively lazy, which is where I get personally irritated. Uh, and again, there's other movies just like this. Uh, one other one I've reviewed called Star Odyssey kind of rose to a tolerable level just because it was a little smarter with its ideas. Others, and one that's been mentioned specifically by other reviewers is War of the Robots, are probably worse, but I'm not going to do anything more with this guy. Now, that brings us to number one, and this is where it's an issue 
just uh, what even survives. It's called Ngagi, and it's from 1930, and this movie was actually banned, partly uh, because it had content that really now would be getting an R rating, uh, but the big thing was that they literally got most of their movie by stealing another movie's footage. Uh, what had happened in about 1915, someone made a silent mo movie documentary about Africa, and then in 1930, a company stole it, added maybe 10 or 20 minutes of new footage, and that included footage that was supposed to show African black women, let's say, marrying gorillas. Yes, so uh, this was the most brutal experience I've ever had. I've debated doing a new video about this, but this is as far as I'm going to go. It's really as far as I can go without actually watching this damn thing again, which I do not want to do. Uh, and what just makes it mental torture, there's this narrator who is right at the border between banal and, I'm thinking even how to put this, pompous. Yeah, so he talks really like he expects us to think he's really important, uh, but it's still just irritating and dull. And he keeps saying stuff that's both obnoxious and offensive, especially about African women. Uh, some of the footage was African women and people. Others were just African-Americans wrangled in. Uh, he says things about their appearance, uh, let's just say their figures, that just sounds like it could be from a literal slave auction. Uh, and it's not even just about the women, also about some of the men, which uh, gets even more uncomfortable. And then uh, the stuff that was added to the movie uh, is either really contrived and corny, uh, they have what are supposed to be staged animal attacks uh, that they advertise as having people killed, some of that might have happened when the actual documentary was made, but all of this was shot in the United States, sometimes at zoos. It shows animals that either didn't exist or weren't even from Africa. There is literally a turtle with or tortoise with wings glued on that they say was venomous and dangerous. Obviously, that didn't exist. Uh, they show an armadillo, which is only from the Americas, and say it's somehow dangerous or a flesh eater. And uh, one of the apes they show and say is dangerous is an orangutan, uh, which is from not Africa, but Asia. Mainly what we call Indonesia, though that uh, politically is a bit complicated. And when you get to the part that you expect to be offended by, you really can't even see anything. You'll see more if you look at the preserved stills of this movie than if you actually watch it. And the weirdest part is when they show this gorilla, it's just a guy in a suit, and the suit's so strangely made it actually makes the gorilla look smaller than a human. Uh, and that's really because of how different our proportions are. Uh, they, to make the gor it look more like a gorilla, made the body go further down than it really would on a human. Uh, so it looks like just a big uh, gorilla torso with stumpy little legs at the bottom. Uh, and again, you just cannot see a damn thing here. Yes, so with this movie, if you tell me you can watch Ngagi 
and still say you've seen another movie that's worse, I will absolutely take your word for it. Uh, because I do not want to get any further than this than I have. Uh, now, as I was saying, this is a film that was banned for a long time. Uh, the real situation, we were pretty sure it did exist, but it was still up in the air whether it was really going to get out there now. It's been put out on a disc, Blu-ray release, and you can get it free on the internet. Uh, it's effectively public domain, probably in part because if anyone claimed the rights to it, they might still be sued by the people who had made the footage uh, that was stolen to make the film, if any of that hadn't fallen into the public domain. Uh, and overall, when I was rating it, I just gave it an unrated rating, what I called Guinnessant, just because this is so beyond the pale for active laziness and uh, being obnoxious and stupid. You really can't judge it by anything but its own time. Of course, it's also wildly racist, uh, but again... It's like the 70s TV movies. It was racist and deceptive then. It's still racist and deceptive now. Only we can see through it. And that brings me uh, as far as I wanted to go with this. It's gone longer than the original video. Probably longer than any other videos I'm going to do anytime soon. Uh, but this was what I needed to cover all the material I had. I might be coming back to some of this, but not anytime soon. Unless maybe I do something with Ngagi. But again, I just don't want to deal with that again. So I'm going to sign out. As I've said, uh, if you're going to watch a movie, watch something that's good.